So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Hope you're enjoying your lunchtime conversations. Now we're going to extend it and have a wider conversation here on a fascinating topic. My name is Tom Banchoff. I'm Vice President for Global Engagement here at Georgetown and a professor in our School of Foreign Service uh, and our Department of Government. And on behalf of President DeJoya and our entire Georgetown community, I'm delighted to welcome you to our third Global Futures Initiative lecture this semester with Ertherin Cousin, Executive Director of the United Nations World Food Program. Thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. Our topic is Zero Hunger, a Foundation of Global Stability and Prosperity. Now, after her remarks, Executive Director Cousin will be joined by my colleague Mark Giordano, who is Director of Georgetown's Program in Science, Technology, and International Affairs in our Walsh School of Foreign Service. Uh, Mark uh, served as an economist on food issues in the USDA for some nine years and then for 11 years in Sri Lanka on global food issues. So one of our resident experts on this very important topic. Now, as you know, this past fall, the UN endorsed a series of sustainable development goals designed to end poverty, fight inequality and injustice, and tackle climate change by 2030. Now, there are 17 goals in all, and goal number two is zero hunger. And I think you'll agree that ending hunger and achieving food security is both a moral and a practical imperative. Zero hunger is our collective ethical obligation in a world of ample resources, but it also makes good policy sense as ending hunger will help to promote development, security, and stability on a global scale. Now, as we'll hear today, the road from here to there will be a difficult one, given the complex connections that exist between food security, climate change, and hunger around the world in different contexts. Uh, complex connections that, through the ambitious efforts of the WFP governments and civil society, and in partnership, we hope, with universities, universities like Georgetown, we'll be able to tackle together in the years ahead. Okay. So a lot of interest here in this topic. And of course, there's no one better qualified to introduce it for us, to frame it for us, than Arthur and Cousin, who became executive director of the World Food Program in 2012. In her leadership role at the WFP, the, the world's largest humanitarian organization, with some 13,000 staff serving more than 90 million beneficiaries, Ms. Cousin directs efforts to meet urgent food needs while championing longer-term solutions to food insecurity and hunger. Now, before taking the helm at the WFP, Ms. Cousin gathered 25 years of national and international nonprofit government and corporate leadership experience in areas of food, hunger, and resilience strategies. She served as U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Agencies for Food and Agriculture, as White House Liaison to the State Department, and as Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Feeding America. A Chicago native, Ms. Cousin is a graduate of the University of Illinois at Chicago and the University of Georgia Law School. So ladies and gentlemen, please joining me in welcoming Ambassador Arthur and Cousin and Professor Mark Giordano. Well, good afternoon. I, Vice President and Professor Tom Bankoff, uh, Pre Professor Mark Giordano, who I look forward to sharing a conversation with as after I complete these um, remarks, Dean, other professors, ladies and gentlemen, thank you to the Office of the Vice President of, of Global Engagement and the Global Futures Initiative for this opportunity to contribute to your dialogue on the global future of food security. So as I stand here as the executive director of the World Food Program, and you having heard that introduction, many of you may have some idea of what we at the World Food Program do, but I would hazard a guess that even those of you who think you know don't really know what we do. So what I would like to do is start my presentation with a short video clip on the World Food Program.
Okay. Now let me just say, it is truly a pleasure for me to be here with you today. With you, the faculties, the students, and visitors, and to engage with you on the challenge of not only achieving zero hunger, but to also engage with you regarding the challenges and opportunity for achieving peace and stability for all, which is a prerequisite to zero hunger. Ladies and gentlemen, as we meet here today, it's not news to this audience that our world is increasingly engulfed in turmoil. With unprecedented levels of intrastate conflicts and emergence of non-state actors generating hardship and instability, undermining global peace and prosperity, Syria, Yemen, Iraq, and South Sudan command the headlines every morning. Violence and insecurity also rain down terror in often unforgotten or forgotten conflicts, such as Nigeria, Libya, DRC, Somalia, and the Central African Republic. All in all, more than 1.5 million people are affected by violence and insecurity each day. A further almost 800 million people endure hunger and food insecurity. And now, since the end of war, the Second World War, and not since the end of the Second World War, have so many people withstood forced migration, now estimated to affect some 60 million people. Yes, when we look at the facts, coupled with the resurgent calls for isolationism, it is clear the unprecedented level of crisis, hunger, and poverty render us far from realizing the United Nations founding pro pro promise for social progress, reaffirming the equal rights of all men and women in freedom from want and fear. Because whether we speak of protracted conflict in Syria or persistent crisis in the Sahel, the reality is in today's daunting challenges, they, these challenges generate fragility and risk far beyond people's traditional capacity to mitigate and cope. And these challenges demand a new collective response. The truth is, today's shocks not only arrest stability and prosperity, they reverse economic gains, particularly for those furthest behind, often the most affected by climate change and war, but always, always the most marginalized. Tough people working to survive in marginal places. In these situations, neither humanitarian nor development activities will overcome the challenges of affected populations without concrete political solutions to the root causes. Ladies and gentlemen, conflict is widely recognized as a cause of hunger. Serious crisis represents a typically tragic case in point, with the conflict now in its sixth year. Syria, pre-war, served as the breadbasket of the region. Now, people's ability to access food and basic services, as well as their capacity to produce and trade, deteriorates exponentially with each passing year. Today, more than 13.5 million people remaining inside Syria require humanitarian assistance of some form. 4.5 million of those inside Syria await expectantly each month, trapped in besieged and hard to reach areas, never knowing if this is the month when the trucks will receive the permission to come to provide support, to deliver assistance. And more than 4.8 million Syrians found refuge across the region after five years, generating regional instability. And now, fearing the situation at home, helpless and hopeless, many of those people are seeking opportunity further from home, igniting even more global instability and challenges. Increasingly, however, Hunger is widely acknowledged as a cause of instability. 
there is a growing body of evidence leaking, linking food insecurity with conflict. Recall the 2007-2008 food price crisis, when high food prices made food inex inaccessible even to working people in many urban communities, and led to urban protests worldwide, from Mexico to Sri Lanka, from, uh, from Accra to Port-au-Prince. Or the Eric Spring, which was ignited by a 26-year-old fruit and vegetable seller at his last act of desperation when he could no longer feed his family. Or even closer to home, in Central America's Northern Triangle, where I just returned from last week, where hunger combined with poverty drives violence and out migration. Or take a more an example that is in the headlines, and that's the example of Yemen. In the 1970s, just over 30% of Yemen's children were stunted. When I visited Yemen four years, four years ago, that number, number had doubled to 60% of children suffering from stunting. Yemen's president told me when I visited him four years ago that poverty and hunger are bigger challenges than security and politics. So six months ago, when I returned again to Yemen, the president, now in exile, the country has descended into full-scale conflict beyond all of our worst fears and predictions. Now Yemen faces market deteriorations, lack of access to food assistance, uh, airstrikes on a nightly basis. Let me applaud the recent ceasefire. We're all crossing our fingers that it will hold. But as a result of this challenge that began last April, 7.6 million people now face food insecurity. Some of them in, on the brink of a famine or starvation situation because of our lack of access to those population. And UNICEF estimates that the rates of severe acute malnutrition or wasting among children in Yemen the worst case scenario where the body starts to waste away have doubled in the last year from 160,000 to 320,000 cases now. Granted, the root causes of conflict vary greatly. Often the consequence of a com combination of political, institutional, economic, and social stresses. The literature across academic disciplines points to a broad set of potential factors. These include, and many of you could rattle these off faster than I can, ethnic tension, religious competition, real or perceived discrimination, poor governance, and state capacity, competition for land and natural resources, population pre pressures and rapid urbanization, as well as economic factors such as poverty, youth unemployment, and food security is often a causal factor. Further, a growing body of evidence demonstrates that, this that there is also a causal relationship between weather and civil conflict, and because weather affects food security, and food security is a causal factor for conflict. One study estimates that drought-related conflicts account for 90% of active conflicts today. Since the 1950s, El Nino alone is estimated to have had a role in 21% of all civil conflicts. Consider the impact of the El Nino phenomenon, predicted to be the strongest on record, particularly affecting marginal agricultural areas right now as we speak in countries like Somalia, Ethiopia, Guatemala, and Bangladesh. But you say El Nino is a weather-related weather -related occurrence that occurs cyclically. What about the effects of climate change? Well, let's look at Mali. In Mali, a, sim 
and arid, molly arid and semi-arid conditions and changing de desert boundaries have often led to deadly clashes between agricultural farmers and pastoralists. In addition, policies favoring agricultural expansion to the detriment of pastoralists, restrictions on the access to natural resources, the use of repressive force by the government and the perpetuation and the perception that the government misappropriated international humanitarian aid that was meant for the drought have all been factors that have unmistakably deepened the grievances of pastoralists, creating conflict and deepening insecurity. Conflict in Mali in 2012 also coincided with the region-wide Sahel drought. The Sahel drought affected 3.5 million people. The combination of both the drought and the political turmoil eventually led to the displacement of nearly 300,000 Malian people, including more than 160,000 who fled to neighboring Burkina Faso, Niger, and Mauritania, countries that were also experiencing drought conditions. The drought wiped out tens of thousands of cows and sheep. The government uh, was unable to assist and provide relief for the pastoralists. And the livelihoods of many Malian Turks, a pastoral ethnic group, were devastated. Masses of people were driven into extreme poverty and food insecurity, which in turn allowed the ranks of armed rebel factions to swell and co coerced others into stealing and looting simply to feed their families. Mali may seem like an extreme case. However, we are beginning to see similar patterns from across the Sahel right through to Somalia, illustrating the vicious cycle of hunger and poverty, deepening or at the very least perpetuating conflict and instability. If we accept the economist and de demographer, demographer, sorry, demographer's projections that by 2030, the vast majority of the world's population will live in conflict and climate affected areas. Some 650 million people will remain left behind, trapped in hunger's vicious, vicious cycle. And we must act now and act differently. Because without basic needs, hope, nor opportunity, today's conflicts, migration, and poverty challenges are just the tip of the iceberg. People will not stay in places where they have no hope or no opportunity. What those tools that we all hold, our iPhones, our cell phones, have done is given everyone a glimpse into the world outside of their realities. And so where we have no hope and opportunity in the countries of origin, people will move. People will fight back. And we are now in danger of losing the next generation. There is, however, some good news. By addressing climate change and sustainably building local economies, we can create a virtuous, a virtuous circle, cycle, strengthening social cohesion, providing vulnerable people with a necessary peace and stability dividend. Thankfully, we possess many entry points to do just that. Last September, and I'm gonna skip ahead, um, Last September, when the United Nations came together, as you heard, 193 member states, in 17 seconds, agreed to the 17 Integrated Sustainable Development Goals. The world reclaimed not only the values, but also the vision the United Nations founders set forth 70 years ago. This is an integrated and ambitious agenda. The global goals establish three important principles. First, our persistent failure to end extreme poverty and hunger, 
not only okay, not only renders sustainable development and prosperity impossible, it makes global peace and security simply illusory. Second, achieving universal sustainable development requires specific effort to reach those furthest behind first. And third, by giving a deadline of just 15 years, leaders confirmed the task of achieving zero hunger, as well as the other 16 goals, is not only urgent, it is achievable. Because together, across multi-sectors, not just the UN, not just government, but private sector, faith communities, NGOs, working together, we do maintain the knowledge, which also includes educational institutions, technology, and the means for, su to, for success. So where do we start? We start with the most vulnerable people. And the recognition that truly reaching all of the world's hungry poor requires a fundamental transformation in how we collectively work. Business as usual is insufficient. If we fail to change what we do and how much we do, we will not realize the change in the time or at the scales leveled, levels required for success. But with the right investments and the global political will, Agenda 2030, despite its complexity, is achievable. But it requires the need to accelerate action now, addressing five critical blind spots changing how we think and act, and crucially, how we finance global, national, and local efforts to end conflict, hunger, and poverty. First, we must recognize the need for greater political engagement and international co cooperation to address prolonged and protracted crisis. As UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon noted, protracted crises by their very definition and their very duration lead to a weakening of the institutions of the rule of law and the support systems providing the foundations of society. But overcoming ongoing conflict as well as conflict prevention will require steadfast global reengagement and commitment to end ongoing political crisis prop and propagating crisis. Investing in the root causes of crisis, providing parties with an alternative way forward other than conflict. Admittedly, no easy task in an ever more global xenophobic client, climate. Second, the second blind spot where we must invest, we must harness the full power of technology and innovation. In a world where 93% of people have access to mobile phones, we must ask ourselves, how can we best leverage this level of connectivity for empowering people, the most vulnerable people, to improve not only their livelihoods, but their lives? Such mobile phone penetration off offers enormous potential to provide access to information, training, and basic financial services, particularly for those furthest behind. And by 2020, if we can harness, manage, and effectively utilize the some 44 trillion gigabytes of stored data, it will not only expand knowledge, but improve decision making, providing agricultural value chain improvements, including market access. Third, we must prioritize support to smallholder farmers. 
particularly those living in marginal lands. 80% of the people WFP supports today live on marginal lands in rural areas. The reality is some 70% of the world's 1.4 billion people who live on less than $1.25 a day depend on rain-fed agriculture in a time of climate change. Smallholder farmers managing over 90% of the world's farms stand at the front line of food stability and security. If we could capture the 40% of post-harvest losses in sub-Saharan Africa alone. Today, it equals more than all of the food assistance delivered across the continent on an annual basis. So scaling up efforts to provide the right tools, training, infrastructure investments, as well as predictable access, enables smallholder farmers not only to feed their families, but also achieve a productive, resilient, and sustainable livelihood. Realizing such small farms' potentials requires employing new tools, including mobile technology for information transfer and money management, and also investing across the entire value chain, not just in upstream, but down in, the, in downstream market development as well. Fourth. Doing things differently, overcoming blind spots, means we must quickly scale up social protection programs. Addressing the challenges of the bottom quintile, creating the safety nets that will ensure truly no one is left behind. Social protection comes in many forms, including cash transfer, school meals, public work schemes, and weather index insurance programs. Here in the US, we provide these safety nets, programs like the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program and subsidized school meals, which we take for granted, but they provide the safety net to ensure that people who otherwise cannot access food in this country can avoid going hungry. In conflict settings, protracted crises or situations of extreme poverty, school meals efficiently combat hunger and reduce absenteeism, providing an incentive for children, particularly girls, to learn and stay in school. Productive safety net programs, for example, in Ethiopia proved instrumental, using cash as an incentive for communities to transform their livelihoods and landscapes through terrace farming, reversing decades of environmental degradation. Rolling out social protection for all the world's hungry people may seem like a pipe dream. It is not. A recent study WFP undertook together with FAO and EFAT estimates an average annual investment of $267 billion globally <clears throat> would support the social safety nets required for the entire global community. This number is just a fraction of the estimated $3.5 trillion yearly cost of hunger in lost GDP, as well as in uh, the effects that it has on communities across the global world. The fifth and most important blind spot we must address is the need to fully and finally acknowledge and end women's disempowerment by providing women with equitable access to hope and opportunity, we can begin to make the changes that will achieve a zero hunger world. Today, in too many places around the world, women still lack equitable access to opportunity, presenting a fundamental barrier to the achievement of zero hunger. Although women and girls account for 52% of the world's po population, in far too many places, they are unable to access basic services, education, and resources required not only to fulfill their own, but also their community and ultimately their country's potential. For example, Despite the fact women in sub-Saharan Africa provide between 40 and in some countries as much as 80% of the labor force on small 
farms. Women are often chiefly, and women are often chiefly responsible for the storing, processing, and selling of their harvest. Women today, despite these facts, own or manage less than a quarter of the total agricultural land. Women have access to less than 10% of all the agricultural credit. Leaving women locked out of opportunities is counterproductive. With women's equitable access to necessary seeds, tools, and credit, Sub-Saharan Africa's farm yields could increase by as much as 20 to 30% annually. With women's equal status, the incidence of underweight births in Southeast Asia could fall by as much as 28%. And ensuring meaningful roles for women in peace negotiations, and you won't be surprised by this, when a woman is sitting at the table, it increases the success of the negotiations by at least 50%. Giving women the uh, worldwide the opportunities they both deserve and need isn't just the right thing to do. As they say, it's the smart thing to do. Opportunities for the poorest women must include well-designed social protection, together with targeted financial credit and extension schemes, empowering women to transform their lives. Technology, again, offers enormous potential to connect women culturally or geographically isolated, providing the information necessary to increase farm yields, access credit, and to inform more productive market participation. These opportunities and changes must, of course, be accompanied by law and policy reform giving women more access to land ownership, including inheritance opportunities. Ladies and gentlemen, while acknowledging the interconnectivity of the sustainable development goals and accepting that no one goal will be sustainable and durably achieved without the achievement of all the other goals, Addressing these five blind spots, increasing political engagement to reduce or prevent conflict. Second, leveraging technology and innovation. Third, prioritizing smallholder farmers. Fourth, adequately supporting social protection and social safety net programs. And finally, it's achieving gender equity as well as gender equality can provide the Zero Hunger Foundation necessary to achieve the other 16 goals and, as a result, a stable and more prosperous world. In conclusion, these most challenging times, when it looks like our global safety is threatened now more than ever, is the time for us to pull together and to work collaboratively, to work collectively to deliver the right actions for a safer today and a stronger tomorrow for everyone everywhere. I am reminded of the words of the Dalai Lama who said, peace can only last where humans are respected, where people are fed, and where individuals and nations are free. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we the peoples can collectively overcome the challenges of climate change and conflict to build a world of zero hunger where every woman, man, and child lives life to their fullest potential. Because ending poverty and ending exclusion is the only way we can achieve global stability and the free and free the world from fear and want. I met a young girl just two weeks ago, Aisha. She was 10 and a half years old. When you're 10, you count every month. So she was 10 and a half years old. I was in Cameroon. Her family had been forced out of Borno State in northern, Niger northern Nigeria by Boko Haram. She sat and listened to me 
talk to her parents and other members of her community about the fear that forced them out of their homes, the fear that kept them from returning to their home, the losses that they experienced when Boko Haram burned everything that they had while they were running away. And here was a child who, when I asked her, what did she want to be when she grows up? She said, when I grow up, I will be a soldier and I will kill Boko Haram and I will free my people. The children are looking at conflict as the only answer. We need to give them a different way forward. Thank you very much for this opportunity and I look forward to engaging with you in conversation. Blackson? Yes. Thank you so much for that really interesting talk. First, I want to compliment you on your ability to gracefully deal with the technological problem and <laughs> keep, keep your talk going, so thank you for that. And second, I wanted to also compliment you or thank you for bringing up the issue of food insecurity in such a multifaceted mm -hmm. way. We often hear of food problems as being one of production, mm -hmm. and we don't hear about political stability, mm -hmm. about equity, mm -hmm. uh, about discrimination as being part of it. So with that, uh, rather than go with the format we initially discussed of me asking you questions back and forth, I'd like to just to open it up to the audience and especially the students to ask questions uh, and get a conversation going that way. But I'm going to reserve the right to ask the final question if it hasn't already been asked by one of the students. So can we start with, with questions from the audience? There's a hand over here. Hi, thank you so much. Oh. Hi, thank you so much for coming. My name is Mark Lee, and I'm a student in global health here at Georgetown. Um, you know, I know that dietary diversity is a big um, thing for WFP, and I was interested in hearing a little bit more, if you can, about the ways the private sector helps enable diversity um, in the diet with WFP. Well, thank you for that question. And that was very generous of you to say that diet diversity is a big issue for WFP. Because for the first, you know, we're a 53 year old organization. For the first 45 years, diet diversity wasn't so much of an issue. It was about filling stomachs, it was about getting basic commodities corn, uh, maize, sorghum. Um, to uh, wheat and, and oil, et cetera, to the affected populations to ensure people did not starve. But there's been a recognition that it's not just about filling stomachs, that unless we are providing the nutritional content that is also required, that we are not addressing the full challenge of food insecurity. So we have begun to work in a number of ways. We have what local and regional purchasing, which where we work with smallholder farmers as well as with large uh, con uh, brokers to support access to fruits and vegetables um, and other commodities that will, that will increase the diet diversity. We have now moved towards cash-based transfers where we give people access to, in, in as many cases as possible, electronic cash that allows them to purchase more nutritious food and more um, culturally appropriate food in the communities where they live. Um, I, was, I sat on a panel with um, former President of Nigeria, Obasanjo, and he reminded me in front of a very large audience that uh, people in Africa didn't we eat wheat until the, the U.S.'s uh, PO440 program that brought wheat into Africa. And so now, yes, we still bring in commodities because now they do eat wheat in reality. <laughs> Um, but we also work to ensure that we are using new tools to provide more diet diversity, as well as more, nutrition, more access to nutritious foods. There's a question here. Thanks for your remarks. Um, they were amazing. Um, my name is Josefina Correa. I'm from the Master in Biotechnology here at Georgetown. Um, my question is, you talk about um, 
empowering farmers and working with them, uh, also with te technology and yields uh, improvement, etc. Uh, is the WFP doing something in regard to the one third of the actual food being produced in the world that is being thrown away um, that also counts in food security mm -hmm. uh, issues? When you talk about that one third, let me say, first of all say yes, we are doing something. Uh, when you talk about that one third of food that is being wasted, there's different ways the, that the food is lost. Um, one is through post harvest handling practices, um, lack of refrigeration, lack of storage, lack of infrastructure that results in up to, as I said, 40% of the, of the harvest of smallholder farmers in sub-Saharan Africa alone being lost every single year. And we are working with smallholder farmers as well as with FAO and other organizations to support post-harvest handling practices, working with governments to develop infrastructure that will support better storage, uh, easier movement of goods to limit the loss of goods in sub-Saharan Africa in particular. The, we also, and I, I are working with um, organizations like the one that I worked with here in the United States, the Feeding America, which is supporting access to foods, particularly in urban areas, that would otherwise be thrown away. Food from manufacturing, food plants, grocery stores, to have that food redistributed to um, the poor uh, and, and those who otherwise don't have access to food when there is food that would otherwise be thrown away. The, a significant portion of what is lost through waste, WFP doesn't work in those areas, and that is consumer waste. Um, there is, particularly here in the developed world, we throw away a significant amount of food that, um, and that most of it because of over-purchase um, and, and purchasing more than what we, what we need. Um, I am not going to get into that conversation as the, I will say the United States is my largest donor. 40% of the support for WFP comes to the United States. I never talk about the United States when I come into the United States. Um, but there are a lot of people who are working on the issues here in the United States. But I can tell you what we're doing in the EU. The EU, um, you had France just passed a law that they are now trying to take to the European Commission that would make it illegal to uh, dump food from hotels, from restaurants, as opposed to this, um, contributing it to food banks and food pantries, et cetera. So incentivize, I don't know if we want to, make, I don't think we want to make it illegal, but what we want to do is incentivize businesses to support redistribution of unused food as opposed to throwing it away. Thank you. I had to write down my note to make sure I don't screw this up, but um, you had mentioned that 40% of the African continent's food is, uh, is wasted. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm actually in the emergency and disaster management program here mm -hmm. as a master's student. And uh, this semester we're talking about uh, U.S. support to foreign disasters and the, mm -hmm. the political conflicts that can come across working with nation states. Mm -hmm. um, how does, what is the plan to both allocate and collect that, that wasted food? And then is there issues arising between um, using that food in other nations where there's protect, uh, potentially a, a, a political conflict? Well, I would, I would let, me, let me respond by saying we, WFP, don't want to collect that food. What we want to do is give uh, sm smallholders, subsist today's subsistence farmers, access to the tools and support that is necessary so the food does not spoil and is not wasted. That will increase their incomes and give more, put more food into the markets in the countries where it is needed. 
Um, this is not a, a case where if WFP collects all the food and redistributes it, that we could then address the challenges of those who would otherwise go hungry. This is an opportunity for us to increase the economic um, earning power of the smallholder farmers themselves while, substance, while also supporting the agricultural value chain to make it more productive and ultimately provide more food in the market and make it more, the food in the market more accessible to those who would otherwise not have access. Uh, well, one from the dean to break up the student <laughs> questions. <laughs> Thanks, thanks very much for coming, and, and thanks very much for your leadership of WFP at such a, at such a critical time. Um, I want to ask you, you mentioned um, very briefly in your remarks um, what you termed as a, a turn to isolationism. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that concerns me, having lived outside the United States for a long time, coming back to the United States, is that the experience in Afghanistan, Iraq, um, South Sudan, um, to a lesser extent, mm -hmm. um, seems to have led to a, a real f almost fatigue mm -hmm. um, to talk about the sources of conflict, mm -hmm. a fatigue of talking about that there are any types of engagement, I don't want to say intervention, but engagement that can mitigate the sources of conflict. And although Afghanistan and, and Iraq loom large, um, other conflicts in CAR, in northern Mali, and uh, elsewhere in the Horn, Yemen, um, these have all been swept or painted with those same brushes of, of, of failures that we can't do anything mm -hmm. about it. Um, you mentioned that you don't like to talk about the United States when you're in the United States, <laughs> but as the United States is one of your you know, most important um, funders, mm -hmm. how are you seeing that impact the work of WFP? Um, and what can you do, uh, what do you, what, and what should we do mm -hmm. um, here at Georgetown um, to try to counter those views, um, mm -hmm. because at the very moment where we should be paying even more attention to these sources of conflict, uh, we seem to be sort of shutting our eyes and closing our mm -hmm. ears. Mm -hmm. That could, that the answer to that question could engage us for the rest of the afternoon at the very least. Uh, but let me simply say, by recognizing that there is no simple answer there, that first of all, I remember some before 9-11, when one of my very first trips to the Vatican, I met with one of the cardinals and he said to me, you people in the United States, you think you live on a big island and nothing can ever touch you. And you can ignore everything that's happening in the world because you're separated by those oceans. And you have Mexico down there and Canada uh, above you, but for the most part, you're separated, so you ignore it. And then 9-11 happened, and Americans woke up to the fact that there are conflicts in the world we cannot escape. But I think you, your statement of fatigue of how the, we've invested so much and without resolution, that the average person sees tax dollars, troops, equipment, resources going into these countries and that they don't see any outcomes that would suggest that peace is anywhere near the horizon. Um, as a good friend said to me, you look at South Sudan, where we fought, worked and fought in South with Sudan for decades for the liberation of South Sudan. And less than two years later, they were in conflict. And so it would be easy to say, throw up your hands and say, it, it's too much, we can't do it. We don't have that luxury particularly people like those of you sitting in this room. You are and will become ever more as you receive a degree from a very important institution in the United States, thought leaders. And as thought leaders, you have a responsibility to ensure that those who are policy leaders recognize that disengagement 
is not an option. Our security is directly related to the security and stability of the global community. If we haven't learned anything from what we are watching happening with ISIS and, and Boko Haram and others is that you cannot isolate the challenge to the country of origin. We cannot isolate our children. We have children in the US who are going to these places to participate. So we must use our voices there to ensure that those who, that we can, that those who have political leads, who, who maintain political leadership in this country, recognize that we want engagement by the United States. The world depends upon the United States to lead. I, you look at me skeptically, I can tell you, I sit in rooms around the world where people say, what is the United States thinking? What is the United States going to do? I know in a, it is easy to say, not our problem. But we have been engaged in the global community since World War II. Some ways good, some ways not so much. But more ways good than the not so much. And we must have leaders in every generation who recognize the value of engagement and investment and providing the support that is required. By 2050, 20, between 2040 and 2050, it depends upon which uh, demographer you, you talk to or anthropologist you speak to, 83% of the world will live in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And if we do not provide hope and opportunity in those places, the appropriate to support the development of, of good governance in those places, people aren't going to stay. And the challenge that we are seeing in Europe today with migration flows is the tip of the iceberg. But we can invest in those countries. People want to feed their children. They don't want to be in conflict. And so it is an, an imperative that you become the leaders who ensure that the United States continues to provide the support that the global community requires. I am not giving you a pat answer because I don't have one. I didn't come here with that. I tell people all the time there's more of my career behind me than ahead of me and I love speaking to students because you guys are going to pick up this mantle and hopefully do better than we did by committing to ensuring that the things that you are learning, the tools that you can bring, that we take those to the places where we can make the difference and ensure a more stable and secure world. We're out of time for questions. <laughs> uh, but maybe if you could just, um, following on what you just said, wrap up with maybe more concrete suggestions for the students okay. who, um, I'll give an example from the School of Foreign Service where I work. So we were set up about 100 years ago to train, to train the next generation of diplomats before there was a foreign service mm -hmm. even existing. Now, uh, most of our students talk, they want to work in public service, they want to serve the greater good. Uh, only about 4% of them actually go into the, the, the Foreign Service, for example. And they're looking, they want to know what to do and how to get into it. What, what's your suggestion on what they should think about for career paths, wanting to make a positive difference in the world? Well, come work for WFP. <laughs> We're always looking for, for really bright um, uh, young people who can come in and support the activities of our organization. We uh, were listed by uh, Fast Company Magazine last year as one of the most innovative companies in the world, even though we're not a company, because we lean into solving problems with new solutions. And I can tell you, none of them come from me. They come from people who look like you, um, who are smart and bring the tools that you use every day to help us serve better in the communities where we operate. So we are always looking for new talent. But in the not so parochial way, let me also say, the 
I am not going to suggest that if you have 4% of your people going into public service that I'm going to give you a magic answer that's going to suddenly get those who see working for um, a multinational corporation and have the opportunity to do that in international affairs um, would come and work for us. But what I would say is whatever you do, stay engaged in public policy. The reason leaders turn away is what someone who, who I, I won't name, but because you would know them, who said to me one day, Earthrend still feeding the babies? And I said, yes. And he looked at me, he said, you know nobody cares, right? And I said, I beg to disagree with you. But it's because 4% of the students go into public service and the others go into other um, other seek other opportunities that there's a suggestion that citizens don't care, that people don't care. You, we, we can't have those who understand the challenges and want to see resolution silent. And in this day of communication, you all are much better than we were in using those tools to ensure that you are communicating the messages that will ensure that we can build and maintain the public will that is required to support the government's investments from around the world in the multi-year programs and projects that will help us make a difference. You can also do simple things like we have an app called Share the Meal, uh, and I invite you all to go to share the meal. Learn about what WFP is doing. 50 cents can help you feed, buy a school meal for a child in Lebanon. And we change it often. One thing we've learned is that uh, this generation wants to know, okay, what are you doing today? So we have an entire team that is regularly putting up new stories of people that will help you engage directly with those we're serving and supporting. But I'll just say in closing that whatever you do, recognize that for your generation, the world is going to be even smaller than it is today. We talk about big data and what big data will mean for driving change in a global society, and, and as well as communication and transportation and how that will change our world. What is a problem over there tomorrow is a problem here tomorrow as well. What is a problem over there today is a problem here tomorrow as well. And so you must stay engaged. This is a Jesuit school. You know, I'm speaking to <laughs> the people who we expect to lead. But it's easy to turn your back, particularly on an issue like hunger or peace, where you say we have always had conflict or hunger as long as, as man has been on earth. But we need not have it merely because it was our past. If we want to see a different outcome, we must operate differently. So Ambassador Cousins, thank you so much for your insights into global food problems, for sharing your experience about WFP, and for sharing your thoughts on careers for our students. So thank you. Really appreciate it.